<laughs> All right, so I guess the first question you always ask yourself is what is urban conservation? Um, it's the practice of conserving green areas and natural resources in an urban setting. Um, there's a wide variety of practices that I guess I can include under, include under the umbrella of urban conservation. Um, some of our tree and shrub plantings, landscaping with native plants, rain gardens, bioswale, rain barrels, compost tumblers, and kind of anything else that is going to aid in conserving resources in the urban setting. So before you come, you, before you do any sort of conser urban <laughs> conservation program, if you're thinking of developing one, you got to figure out what the need is. Um, is it a large metropolitan area that needs a, a bunch of services, or is it a county with mostly small towns that might just need some native landscaping help? So, kind of, you've got to kind of eva evaluate what your area needs. What works in Fargo may not work in Mohaw, or vice versa. So, the first thing to do is start small. Um, sometimes it gets exciting, especially in the winter when it's a downtime, to want to have all these ideas and implement a bunch of stuff, but that usually doesn't end up working. You kind of want to start small. Um, when I first started at Cass County, some of our small successful programs were the Prairie Planter and the Rain Barrel Compost Tumbler Workshop. So the Prairie Planter was, um, all right, so basically it was a, a, a planter, like you can buy at Menards or Home Depot, but it had native prairie, prairie plants in it instead of non-native ornamentals. And, it cost less than $50 for us to cost share, and we had a fair amount of interest with it. Um, the Ray Barrel and Compost Tumbler, I think we've got four workshops now <coughs> for each of them, and they're, they're filled up every year. We do partner with um, the county across the river, Minnesota, on the Ray Barrel and Compost Tumbler workshop. So we, we are doing two counties for that. There's an example of the prairie planter that we have by our office. It's simply just a, a planter of plants. This one was at a local daycare. So the, the, the Rain Barrel and Compost Tumbler workshops were put on by actually a nonprofit and two uh, SCDs, SWCDs. Participants rec received 60% of the cost of attending the workshop. I think it cost the attendees 30 bucks. And they got a rain barrel and or compost tumbler to take home. <coughs> and then some, something a little bit larger, which we've had the most success with, has been what we call our Pocket Prairie program, which is a really easy acronym for either zero scape or, or pollinator plots. And we cost share 75% of the cost. It says here seed, I should have changed that. Most of our pocket prairies now are done with plugs. So we, we cost share 75% of the cost of the plugs. We are fortunate that we, that in Richland County, I think Enderland's in Richland, or Ransom. What, Ransom. Yeah, okay, so in, in, in Enderland, there is a native plant nursery. All they grow in the greenhouse is native uh, grasses and forbs. Um, I used to get all my, my plugs from places in Minnesota through the mail. Now I simply drive down there with my pickup and I load up on plugs and, and forbs. They sell them for 32 plugs for $100. So if you were a, a uh, homeowner in Fargo and you wanted to do a pocket prairie, you wanted two flats of plugs, um, it cost $200. We will cover 75% of it, so your cost ends up being 50 bucks for those for those plants. And these are kind of geared towards homeowners, small acreage owners. We do do some seed, but in urban settings, starting a prairie from seed is extremely difficult, um, especially like front yard type stuff. We've just found it's much, much easier to use the plugs. It's cheaper, it looks better, they get less complaints. Um, and again, we're, we're fortunate that the United Prairie uh, Foundation, the greenhouse, is there and, and uh, willing and able to provide a ton of different things. Xeriscape is basically the same thing. You're using plants that require less water, less TLC as a means to restore. And we're not restoring any of the prairie we're putting in front of a business. What we're doing is where a lot of it is, it dovetails very well into education. Somebody walks into that business and they see a big blue stem and there's a sign there, they're gonna maybe stop and read about it and learn a little bit more about the prairie. It's also gonna provide pollinator habitat. Um, and a lot of it is for that educational. And also a lot of businesses, if they hire a landscaper or something, some of them don't hire landscapers or homeowners, they don't need to spend as much time working at it if it's a hardy plant and it's, and it's attractive. So why utilize native <laughs> species? They evolved in our climates and soils so they're 
they need less water, they're tolerant, especially in the Red River Valley, the heavy clays, high pH soils. I was just talking with Tom Kell earlier. So many people in Fargo will come in and say, I want to plant sugar maple like I have at my lake. And I said, they're not going to grow. Or I want to plant this. I moved here from Colorado. I want to have this. Well, you've got to realize that in the area, in the Red River Valley is no different than anywhere else, very localized plants that can grow. So if you plant um, purple coneflower, black eyed Susan, a whole bunch of different natives, they're going to grow and they're going to be there instead of having to replant plants when they're dead. Also um, provide habitat for pollinators. <clears throat> so the one that UPF, United Prairie Foundation, really promotes well and, and there's a good reason for it is swamp milkweed. Every small pollinator plant needs to have swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed is a non-spreading, unlike the common milkweed, it's very attractive. It provides habitat for butterflies. It can grow on concrete. It, it's, it's the ultimate pollinator plant. <coughs> so we always make sure that, that swamp milkweed is, in, is included in one of them, um, any of the plantings that we design. Now to design it again, so this was at a baseball field in Fargo, you can see. So we, this was the area they wanted to seed. We brought the plugs in, set them out. General rule of thumb, if you talk to a landscape architect, they're gonna have all these cool things that they design. For me, I always say, you put your plant down, you go two feet around it, that's your design. Um, I try to make sure that we've got the bloom period, spring, summer, fall, some of the height characteristics, but I am not a landscape architect, so when I'm reading about layering and feathering and all this crap, I, I don't, I, for me, what I want to just see is the native plants growing. So I always tell them about two feet, you know, and so here, what we basically did is we set them out there, went and dug the holes and put them, put them down. Now, if it is too large for plugs, seed can be used. Some other things we've been doing is if it's an acre, especially in a public area, let's say along this walk path, the front part of that walk path, we're going to use plugs and then we're going to use seed further back. So at least when people walk by it, they're going to get an idea of what it's going to look like in the future. Um, here's another pollinator plant. This is down near my hometown. This is one that was installed. So this is a really good example of what can happen poorly in an urban conservation program. This was a YWCA. This lady wanted to do everything we offered. She was all gung-ho. We helped her install it. Generally, we don't install it. Um, I drove by two months later and it was deader than a doornail. And I called her and I said, what's going on? She goes, well, I just don't have time to do this. So one big thing is always to make sure these people understand that it's a time commitment. You don't just plant it and walk away. So this one failed. That's the only one I've ever had them actually pay back cost share dollars because the entire planting was a failure because they didn't put any effort towards it. Um, this was at the daycare that my youngest kids go to now. Actually started by seed, we actually got a pretty good take. This was that baseball field one that we seeded. I had the picture of in the dark, so that's, that's what it ended up like. So <clears throat> this one just used natural wood mulch. I am a big proponent in using the landscape fabric we use for trees. Um, laying the landscape fabric down, planting the plants in, putting the mulch in, you will never have a weed problem that way. With the, with the natural mulch, there will be weed problems. Um, of course, it's easy to weed, but this was a, the uh, baseball field, they, they probably wouldn't have weeded. So putting that fabric down really, really helps. Now when you're buying plugs, seed, anything like that, you want to make sure that you're going to vendors that specialize in local sources and species. Again, the United Prairie Foundation <laughs> works great because all of their plants are local ecotype plants. It doesn't make sense to buy a big blue stem plug from out east somewhere and plant in North Dakota and expect it to grow. The no till drill works best for seeding. Broadcasting can work. The other thing is in a seeding, you have to make sure that they understand that it's going to be weedy. There's going to be mowing weed. There's going to be thistle. I get calls all the time, well, there's thistle out there. I said, I told you there's going to be thistle out there. What, what, what should I spray it with? And I always say, go buy yourself a machete and go chop it out. Um, and the plugs are a little more expensive again, but they do ju jump start it. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people, again, want to do big areas. It's always better to start small. They understand what they're getting themselves into and then grow into it from there. Uh, community gardens are a big way that we're also working with uh, urban conservation. So in Fargo alone, I want to say there's probably 35 community orchards or gardens and probably more. But we offer a grant of up to $500, 60% cost share on 
it, it, everything except land, labor, plants. So any sort of infrastructure, tools, equipment, anything like that. And community gardens are an awesome way to really get conservation out there. Um, in an urban area like Fargo, we have a relatively large New American population from Nepal, from Africa, um, from the Philippines. They farmed over there, they moved to Fargo, they live in an apartment in the middle of an urban sprawl. Getting them back to the land to grow crops and to get into the <coughs> dirt is really, really important, I feel like, to, to helping them understand agriculture, farming, um, conservation, and, and, and helping people understand how difficult it is to grow food and how important it is to have healthy soil. So we, I would say we probably give out four or five, or probably more uh, grants every year to community gardens. And again, here's some photos. Um, I mean, some of community gardens have hundreds of members. So it's, it's, a, it's a good way for us to get out there. When, we, when, when they get a grant, they get a sign that's located at the beginning or the entrance of it, has our name on it. The other thing is when you're in any urban conservation project, signage is critically important. They, it's free advertising, and that advertising is much better than any other sort of advertising. Um, urban conservation, also we do a lot of education and outreach, and that's anything from soil, soil health to wildlife to trees to gardening. And it's a little bit, it's not quite directly boots on the ground conservation, but it's getting both students, adults, whoever is taking that or listening to that program, it's getting them to think about their environment. And I noticed in more urban areas, and when I moved to Fargo 20 some years ago now, I looked at Fargo as a little podunker town, and it's still a little podunker town compared to big cities, but there's a lot of people in Fargo that never leave Fargo, Moorhead. And they have no idea when I bring a coyote pelt in that that animal lives anywhere near them. So it's very important to get them to understand their environment, why it's important, and hopefully down the road, why they should be proponents of um, some conservation. So this here, this was a presentation on and gardening at a, I always like to call it, downtown, downtown Fargo hipster stuff. I slip on my skinny jeans and, um, <laughs> you know, head down there. But, and then like this was Amy doing a, um, this was a, was called Water Festival. All the sixth graders come through and learn about the river and water that you can't see it, but it's our uh, um, stream table. This is part of our eco -ed. Our eco -ed is one day and this one here that the Grand Forks eco out on, on wildlife. I always tell Ryan I'll come help at Grand Forks only if I get to do wildlife. Anything else, I'm not driving up there. So um, it is funny though when you're doing a presentation. So I do a lot about <clears throat> wildlife and, and fur bears and animal adaptations. When you're with, it doesn't matter if you're with adults or children, hands on being able to touch things is critically important. Too many times in schools they stand up there and they say, don't touch, don't touch, keep your hands off where if I can pass around this raccoon pelt, kids get to touch it, see it, feel it, that registers more than just seeing something, you know, don't touch. So we try to do as much hands-on stuff as we can because that really helps, you know, kids like, tac adults like tactile um, things. So how to develop a program? So the first thing is always funding. So there's a lot of different grant opportunities you know, the NRCS, we, we used to have a grant through the NRCS, to be quite honest, we've, it got to be too much of a headache, and <coughs> we, we don't anymore, but there's OHF, there's a lot of other urban conservation programs. If you look on the internet, you can find all kinds of them. Obviously, the easiest way to always do a program is to self-fund it. If you have enough money to self-fund it, that way it allows you and your board to have control of the program without anybody telling you you have to do this, this, or this. Um, and again, when you, when you do it, you don't have to think $25,000. You could sit, you know, if you wanted to do a community garden, and there's one community garden in your county and you could help them with a few hundred dollars, it doesn't take a lot of money to really do a lot of big impact. That's the beauty of urban conservation. When you're talking about tree plantings and um, grazing systems and stuff, you can get very expensive very quickly. Where urban conservation, $1,000 can really, really go a long way is in that community. So I guess bringing it all together is, is basically 
you decide as a district what you can offer. You, you decide what your community needs. If your community has zero interest in community gardens or there's no community gardens, there would be no sense to fund the community gardens. Um, so kind of figure out what you, only you know what you need, but and start start small. You know, you prove to your board that there's a that, that, that there's a desire. Prove to your community that there's there, that there's a desire. And ultimately, what you kind of want to do. So with our pocket prairie program, anytime anybody in town now thinks native plants, I get an email, and that's been the goal all along. Is that when they, somebody wants to do native plant landscaping, they come to us because we built the program up. So you start small and you build it up into the point to where. It's successful. If there's things that don't work, we've had things that don't work. Just jettison them. You don't need them. Don't. And that's the beauty of having it as your own. Is you're not. In, if you work with the NRCS for your, you're doing what you told them you're going to do. Sometimes that doesn't work. <coughs> so um, again, decide what your district wants to do, can do, and needs to do, and then I guess create your program. Yeah, like when you go out and do the uh, community garden, mm -hmm. what you say with the native plants, mm -hmm. um, you get the plants for them and you just give them to them and then they yep. do the rest of the work. Yep. You might go out there and take some pictures of them and yep. stuff, but that's about it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because generally it's in May and June when we're yeah. um, super busy. busy. Yeah. Do you just give them a roll of fabric or how do you? So the fabric, a lot of times I'll just go out there and lay it for them because if it's a small amount, it's just easier for me to, cause I, 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 I used to sit in the shop and kick it out and try to, and then it was just, it yeah, so I just go out there and lay it down, stake it, cut it, and then I always kind of tell them that's, that's like a pro bono thing, yeah, we're gonna do that for them, because trying to cut it, measure it, and maybe people are better, I, I suck at it, you end up with stuff all over, yeah, so. Yeah, so generally what I'll do, and some of them will pick them up themselves, mm -hmm. but generally I'll go take the pick up, go by their house or business, set them out there, and then, you know, and I always make that very quick because they always ask, well, so for this price, you guys install it. And I was like, well, no, you know, and, oh. and sometimes for like, let's say a parks project, we, we may go out there and help, yeah. you know, but, but generally, yeah, we just drop it off. Okay. Where is that native plant? Enderlin. Yep. Enderlin. Yeah, Can anyone that, go there and buy yep. it? Is that the one to save the hemp? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Do you, have, do you have an average of how many hours per project you can get into the project? Man, it, 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 so sometimes it's 10 minutes because they would, so the UPF would work closely with them. So the people will come in and I'll be like, where are you from? Oh, uh, you know, Castleton. Oh, so talk to him. They'll send me an invoice and as well. all I do is make sure that they're native plants. Sometimes I'll they'll go to a, a greenhouse with Fargo and I'll look on their thing and say, these, these are native plants or these are, you know, basically beauty varieties of cone flower that are worthless. So I'll go through and, you know, kind of take off the ones that I'm not going to pay for. But and then other ones will come to us and say, I want to do this. You design it all. So those might take 20 hours. You know, so it, it, yeah. there's a lot of variability. Yeah. Okay. Generally, the businesses require more help than the. Because usually the homeowners that are doing it generally are gardeners right. or, you know, um, where the businesses a lot of time have zero idea of what they're doing. So. And sometimes I'll hold their hands longer too, just because Education. it behooves us to have that succeed. So when you do the businesses, do you normally put the signage for like yep. the plants though too, or um, or do they? Sometimes what I'll do is I'll put the sign up, and then I'll have like plant species include okay. this. So like the one I did it was at a uh, my significant other's place of business. She works with adults with disabilities, so I put up the sign with all the species, and basically. The folks that are there that have the cognitive ability to do it go out there and try to find, okay, find the black, the black eyed Susan, you know, and so, so there's the list, but I don't go and do each individual one generally, unless it's a very small plot. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Well, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jane Decker. I'm the urban conservationist with the Fridley County Soil Conservation, and today I will. I'll kind of go over about what I do and different things that we're doing in the community. So first off, this is our outreach events for the years, uh, the garden series. Our first one we did about no-till gardening, 
And it's kind of funny because I was an agronomist first and now I'm an urban conservationist. Well, as a lot of you guys know, farmers and ranchers are a completely different animal compared to gardeners. I mean, for one, your livelihood is tied to that land where a gardener, not so much. I mean, they have a little extra dollars to throw at things. And two, vanity. Vanity is huge of these people. Uh, quick story, cracked me up. I was visiting with this gal and she, I talked her into doing cover crops in her garden last fall. Well, that's all fine and good, but I was hoping that, you know, we'd take the next step forward. We'd no-till it, you know, either suffocate the fabric with, or suffocate the cover crop with fabric and sequester or, or take away the sunlight and desiccate it that way and plant right into it. Well, no, she wanted to till it, till it up. She prides herself. She likes that soft, powdery black soil because it looks nice. And it's just like, well, I guess it, vanity is more important. But I mean, we got a foot in the door. We kind of got cover crops going, so at least we're there so far. Uh, also presented for the Bismarck Mandan Garden Club and the Minot Garden Club, uh, we're going to present for Biz Market. So that's where all the individuals that participate in the market they bring in their produce and they sell it. They're going to have uh, environmental days, so that'll be kind of fun each day. Uh, they'll have one on trees, one on water quality, and then one on soil health. So we'll be participating with them in all those. Uh, present out at Podol Farms. They are farmers that bring their produce in the market. And what they do is really cool. They have the schools come out. And so we'll be talking to second graders and just have a great opportunity that way. And then we'll do our mid uh, summer garden tours in both Burley and Morton County. So that's just a few of the things that we're gonna do. Uh, with that water quality, we're gonna do a rain barrel workshop. I know Jeff touched on it, they do quite a bit with it. So we'll be doing the same thing and possibly a compost tumbler workshop at the Garden Expo coming up in April here. And like, Cass County does too. We also have cost share options. Uh, right now through a grant, we can do pollinator plantings, zero scapes, regenerative gardens, vermicompost bins, and rain barrels. And here's a picture of our rain garden out at Minokin Farm. So it's just a good demonstration to show, hey, this is what it could look like. All right, so this was some of the cover crops and pollinator plantings that we were able to do last fall. And again, uh, we'll be doing Another pollinator planting, it's kind of a really cool project. I was contacted as uh, the Lutheran Church Council, and their goal is to put a pollinator planting in every cemetery across the state. So it'll be a really kind of fun project to help participate with them and kind of just another opportunity when people are out there, they can see it. And it's definitely gonna be a real cool project. All right, so what do we got going on out at Minokin Farm? As many of you probably know, we're a demonstration farm. We show a lot of different things. So we'll be doing quite a few different things with the high tunnel and the gar outdoor garden as well this year. Uh, first thing, we planted a John Deere 7000 series two row planter. So we'll primarily use that for corn, but I think we're also gonna experiment a little bit with milpa. For those of you that don't know what milpa is, it's a cover crop, crop based around gourded species, so pumpkin, squash, anything like that. And as you can see, this is a picture here, and it's thick. And the problem with that, it does everything a cover crop's supposed to do, but how do you harvest the pumpkins out of it? You're tripping, you're, so if we're gonna experiment, and if it's in rows, it might be a little easier to handle that way. All right, vermicompost liquid extract. I don't know how many of you have heard about heard Jay talk about this, but we call it worm ju juice for sort, short, but this is our old uh, worm juice facility on how we make it, and I'll go into that a little bit deeper, but we recently put this new pad in, and we put the compost on it, and I guess how we make the uh, worm juice is we'll put compost in there and keep adding to it with worms, and then we'll pour water and at the end of this, we have usually buckets where it filters through and picks up all the good things that the worms leave behind. And we're just gonna do it on a much larger scale for both our field uh, demonstrations and our garden. All right, so what is worm juice? Jay had this analysis in Shallow Water, Texas. It's five, or er, five phylum of fungi, 12 phylum of bacteria. 
370 species in total. So this is a bioinoculant. It's similar in a sense, or what I would closely compare it to as a commercial product as like an inoculant for soybeans. But obviously those just have six species in them where we have 307. So what we do, we usually inoculate our seeds with it before planting. And then we'll also apply it as a foliar layer. And if there's any issues, fungus, blight, that type of thing, and it really seems to help. And just to show here, uh, this is a cucumber leaf. It's a foot across, which is a pretty big cucumber leaf. And because it's that size, we're sequestering that much more sunlight, we're putting it back down into the ground. So we'll be kind of experimenting with that on and off too, because that'll lead right into the nutrition and bricks testing that we're gonna do. Through a ground, we're gonna actually kind of go into it and we're gonna nutrition test our own vegetables. I guess between probably Jay and myself and Daryl, Dan Kittridge kind of gave us this idea because he's a doctor that says, well, just because it says something on a label in the grocery store doesn't mean that's what's it. And the other thing we're gonna test is Everybody always says, well, if I grow it myself, it's healthier, right? Well, is it? We don't know. So we'll be kind of comparing the high tunnel <laughs> to the outdoor garden. And the reason I want to compare that, especially with bricks as well, is because I heard a professor named Tom Dykstra talk a little bit about it. And he made the comment that if it was a healthy plant, you wouldn't ever have bugs attack it. And he also made the comment that you could never have a truly healthy plant in a high tunnel or greenhouse because it just cannot get enough sunlight. So we'll test it. I mean, it'll be interesting to see, especially if we do the nutrition te test and bricks as well. We're gonna do with and without worm juice. And of course, the good old grocery store, that's gonna be our control. Because we gotta say, hey, we have better veggies in the grocery store. And then specific species that we're gonna be comparing, uh, corn, carrots, no dig potatoes versus conventionally grown. This one I think will be really interesting. And for those of you that don't know what no dig potatoes are, you start with bare dirt essentially, you can add a little compost and then you cover it with an alfalfa bale and water it. And then that way, when it comes time to harvest, this is a picture right here of it, instead of digging them up, you just spread apart the alfalfa and there they are. And plus we're not tilling the soil. So it makes sense, right? So that'll be kind of fun to compare. And then cabbage, just because that's a, got a nice big leaf surface area, so I figured for bricks that would probably make life a little simpler. So in a nutshell, real quick, that's what I do. You guys got any questions? Or? So the worm juice, are you guys thinking that'll be able to be like utilized by farmers? Or are you guys thinking like, uh, in town people or something like that? I or think what do you in think about like what kind of scale you guys are thinking easier. about? You, know? you can need a big much bigger scale. scale. Well yeah. You can buy bioinoculant now. We prefer to raise our own at the Noken farm, mainly you know for the demonstration, but when you use your own products, generally your own biology or let me rephrase that. When you use your own products from the land or the area that you're in, your biology tend to match up. So we use our worm juice on, uh, we use it as an infertile treatment on our crops. And so generally we're putting down about four gallons an acre on that. Uh, Jaden described it in the high tunnel and in our gardens. We use it as a seed treatment and as a foliar. The fact that we may, well, we will, we'll do a different test on this year's worm or verma compost extract, and it may have way more species or way less. We don't know. It's all pretty new, uh, and we don't know if 370 is a lot. It sounds like a lot, right? But it might. We might get 30 in the next batch. So, and think of it too as not being a fertilizer. It's a, it's a bio stimulant. Mm -hmm. We did a N, P, and K analysis on it, and it's very little. So. 
Jay is around today. I don't know if oh, he's here. I, know. I mean, obviously he's the one to ask. So if you have questions. All right. Well, I'll get rolling with this. Um, I'm sure you guys can see me around. Ryan Thorson with the Grand Forks County Soil Conservation District. Um, these two guys, if they are um, in adulthood of their community garden, that ours are, are not community gardens, but they're urban conservation, I guess we would be like more like a toddler in art. Unfortunately, we built a nice new shop, and then shortly after that, um, we know what happened these last couple of years. So we had all these grand plans, or at least I did, to have more um, workshops, um, urban conservation things, you know, build a rain barrel, build a compost tumbler. And unfortunately, those type of things got put on hold. But um, I'll talk a little more about it in here. But um, I, my talk is mainly focused on, well, basically what we've done so far. And we have, we have been busy with this community garden over the last, I think 2017 was when we kind of started this. So the first thing about, <laughs> A community garden is obviously you got to find a spot to have a community garden. We were fortunate enough, um, the city, um, I believe there used to be a couple dilapidated homes here that were tore down, so you can imagine when they filled the basements in what kind of ground it was when we first started. It was a lot of fill. I mean, there were chunks of cement, nails, you name it, it was in there. But it was free ground to start our community garden and you know if you look at it like a challenge right like this is almost as bad as it gets so we'll see what we can do um this picture here well first off i guess there's multiple plots it's a pretty long and i think it's 30 or 40 feet in width but it must be oh a couple hundred feet long so there's there's quite a few different plots um 15 to 20 plots is kind of what i um, estimated our plot is about 20 by 30 feet, so it's pretty manageable. And that's that's about the same size that all the tenants have. Um, the city has, uh, it's through the um, Grand Forks Public Health, they actually have a grant. So everybody who utilizes this garden space gets it for free. Um, so And mostly it's um, new Americans, um, low income families, that type of thing. That have. And then, with our produce, we donate all of it to uh, either the Salvation Army or the Northland Rescue Mission in Grand Forks. Um, another nice thing, there's a water spigot. Um, right across, it would be like right over here, across this alleyway is the old water treatment plant. It's going to be decommissioned at some point. We thought it was going to be this year. Turns out it's still on hold, so we'll get this community garden space one more year, but they have a usable hose, um, hose bib, and fortunately we don't have to drag the hose very far, but the people that are at this other end over here, they gotta drag out you know, 100 feet, 200 feet of hose to the water there, but at least it's an option and you're not hauling buckets around. This picture we did, uh, um, we offered to lay fabric down for any tenants that wanted, and it, there was a lot of interest that first year. I think um, then some of the people tore it up and then didn't want to do it again. I think a lot of people will find weeding therapeutic. Mm -hmm. I am not one of them. The worst days, I mean, even with fabric, there's weeds that come up, as you guys know from trees, there's weeds that can find a way in a staple hole, right? So especially when you're dealing with ground that was fill and brought in from God knows where. Do you leave your fabric on, Ryan? Or yeah, you yep, it? yeah, we leave our fabric. We haven't, other than if you get a chunk that starts to fray and get lifted up in the wind, then we'll replace chunks at a time. But yeah, we try to use it um, as long as we can. We haven't had to replace the whole bit yet. And there's a couple other gardens that are running on three or four years now, and they haven't, they seem to like it. Um, theirs actually looks a lot better than ours. We've had issues with it tearing in ours, I don't know. Um, yeah, just what we were talking about, we promote the, you know, using the fabric as a, as a no-till. There is a push, especially the, you know, these past few years for more community gardens and um, dealing with these food deserts, they call them, where people don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And, um, fortunately in North Dakota, I mean, it happens, but you don't see it as, as much as you would see in larger cities. We did um, acquire a composter, a 
as well. It's a big barrel compost there. I don't know, it's probably a few hundred bucks, but the city had it and they didn't know what to do with it. So we've been using that, but it's amazing how, I mean, obviously Monoma Farm's way more advanced with their composting than we are, but any weeds that we pull that aren't going to seed, we throw in there and we'll fill that thing up. And then, you know, a month or two later, you, you look in there and it's almost like you didn't put anything in there. So it breaks down quite a bit. We usually in the first part of the spring, we'll take the net compost and then we'll just pull up backs and fabric and then just lay it down there just to get some organic matter in there. But Um, so a couple different ways we've promoted this. This is kind of, this here we do a gardening Saturday at the Alaris Center um, Extension puts it on. And they allow us to have a free educational booth there. There's a lot of booths where people sell things, um, knickknacks, whatever, garden related plants, tons of plants. And they let us just have a little educational booth there. So. We have a rain barrel on display and a compost tumbler and then just a bunch of different handouts and things like that. So it's a nice way I and mean, there's a ton of foot traffic and it's all gardeners. It's crazy. And these old ladies will come up to you and they will know the answer to the question they're going to ask you just to see if you know the answer to it. So it's very intimidating. Um, but you can sometimes you can be your BS your way through it. But then they'll let you talk and then they'll tell you the correct answer <laughs> afterwards. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, why did you just waste my time? But anyway, our name got out there anyway, even if it's that dumb ass that was at the booth that you know, was talking about. So and this this was just uh huh, that was the extent of the people that came to our um little gardening showcase at the end of the year where we had the same thing, rain barrel with a diverter kit and then a compost tumbler there. So um, one thing with advertising, if you can pair up with extensions, they're really good one. They, they're really good at getting the word out to the public. Um, it can go a long way. This we just put on our Facebook page and our, um, that was it basically our Facebook page. And we went, I mean, we were going to be doing things there anyway, just clean up, so it wasn't a big deal. This picture, you can see the big water treatment facility there. Um, and I do partner up with NRCS, um, and they got a cut out of Mighty Mini Microbes. So there's my boy a couple years ago. Was, he came and visited us at the Alaris Center. So here's just a couple flyers that um, we just post them on Facebook saying, you know, try them where it's located at. So. And then you can see our partners are on there too. If nothing else, sometimes there will be the other gardeners there, you know, pulling weeds. They certainly like to do that. And they'll come down and visit with you. And it's, it's pretty neat just to see what the different cultures, all the things that they grow. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy if we get tomatoes and cucumbers. And these other people, they're going crazy. Um, and they can, it's very productive for what that ground looked like when we first started there. So. It's come quite a ways in just four or five years. Um, community garden, keep it clean. Uh, we try our best. You know, of course, when things are growing is when I'm busy, and a lot of times I'll just swing over there at the end of the day on my way home from work, make sure that you know we don't have a bunch of weeds going to seed, and we don't have fabric that's doing this and things like that. Because ours is in a pretty high traffic area. It's it's right downtown. So we just don't want people to think that we're slobs and then, um, you know, they take away our garden space. That would be awful. I mean, it wouldn't get much worse than that to get a free garden space taken away. So, um, but this, it's hard to see, but we had some rabbit issues. Um, I finally had things that were coming up real nice. And then the next day they were down to the ground and I had to start over. So. I didn't blast them, but I put up a fence here anyway. Something about being in the middle of downtown, I figured that was the safest play um, there. But it worked. Um, the rabbits didn't bother, and then the deer just went over the top. <laughs> and it, so it's, the animals are just out to get you. But uh, We did end up getting quite a few green beans out of there. Um, it's You just keep trying different things, see what works. We do starter plants in the office. 
and usually I'm not patient enough to harden them and then I put them in the ground and then the next day it's 110 and I come back and you can't even tell I put anything in the ground. So, you know, I'm kind of a terrible gardener, but I keep trying anyway every year and eventually we'll get there. Um, these two pictures here are from uh, the urban conservation workshop we had a couple, three years ago, I think. Two years ago, maybe three years ago, yeah, 2019. And uh, the NDSU's got some pie tunnels there, and they've got some cool stuff going on um, there. So uh, when we had it in Fargo, that was something we need to need to check out and see how they were doing things. Um, and then we do have a couple little pollinator plots over at the community gardens too, and it's crazy how many bees come and hang out there. And that. The one is pretty mature. It's been there since we started, and you, you can't even find a weed in there. The, the flowers have really taken over nicely, so it's actually really cool um, to see. And it's fenced in, so it, it doesn't keep encroaching on the neighboring garden. So. And then, what do you do if you don't have room for a garden? So I'm about as good of a carpenter as I am a gardener, but here's uh, something I built with a half of a rain barrel and just some scrap wood we had laying around. Um, but it took me, I don't know, a couple hours, probably a lot longer than it take other people. But anyway, it works, so I filled it up. Um, I kind of grew a couple tomatoes in it. Um, but it take, doesn't take that much room, put wheels on it. You know, you can move it around, even if all you've got is a little patio. You know, it's something you could grow, I suppose, four tomato plants, a couple tomatoes, a couple peppers. Um, keep it right out there and off. Rabbits aren't going to get to that thing, so um, if it's on your deck, hopefully the deer don't get to it either. <laughs> but you put the lakes higher, I guess, if the deer are a problem. But here's just a little feed bunk. One of our supervisors got it in an auction, and um, one day it was at the tree shed, so I was like, okay. So I did some shallow rooted things in there, and radishes did really well. Uh, basil here went crazy. I donated a lot of basil. Who knows if anybody used it, but it was a ton of basil. And then certain things, onions did all right. So yeah, anything shallow really would have done all right there. I was surprised. It was only seven inches deep, and I thought, oh man, I'm gonna have to water this thing every day. And shoot, I went. There was a couple long weekends there, on four days without watering them, and I came back, and they were as lush green as ever. So I, I don't know. They found water somewhere, but. Um, and then this is just something I stole from online, but it's another idea, you know, you can use those buckets to save space, but still get a lot of different um, plants growing there for not too much money. And of course, you can keep using it year after year. Some resources, uh, this cool, uh, I think it's a Facebook page, this Food Not Lawns, it's pretty, <coughs> that's kind of what this is from too. Um, I'm in a neighborhood, if I try to Food Not Lawns and turn my whole lawn into a garden, the city would be knocking at my door pretty quick, I think, or all the other neighbors would be anyway. But um, it's a pretty cool idea. Um, even if you're just doing perennials and not necessarily vegetable gardens. But, um, and then uh, this is another website. NACB, they have a National Association of Conservation Districts. They actually have a community, or not a community garden grant, that's what most people use it for. The Urban Conservation Grant that um, comes out usually it's late winter, like I think the deadline is January 31st um, every year it's been coming out. Um, and I, it's, we've never applied for it, um, but there's a lot of um, districts across the country that um, use that to start community gardens. The problem with us is we, once we lose this ground, we don't have a backup plan for a community garden. So, but the, the city, the health department there is working on getting some new ground for us to partner up with them again. So that's all I got. Is there any questions? Ryan, did you add any amenities to your soil because it was too spilled when you started, or did you just no. go with it? We just went with it just to see what we could do. We wanted to be as minimal and as many inputs as possible right away. It was surprising. The tomatoes go go crazy in there. We. There hasn't been too many things that if they would have just been left alone by the critters. They, I think almost everything we've planted has done very well. Um, watermelons, 
going nuts in there and then the deer coming into watermelon. But or actually there's been times where people would just walk by and say that looks like a good watermelon. And, but I just it's comforting to know that maybe somebody's eating it and it's not the deer. So usually when the deer eat it, you know it because it's been smashed up. But yeah, I was surprised and even now um, we've been using the, the same ground over and over and we haven't had to add anything. We don't disturb it either, so I suppose that helps. And we do a we do a slake test every year just to see how ours, you know, lift up the fabric and see how ours compares to the ones down the way that like to pull weeds. And it is pretty it's pretty substantial how different it is. I have a question for all three of the presenters. Do you have any suggestions for smaller SMEs who don't aren't from the urban centers to try and get urban conservation out there? Start with, you know, planning a little rain garden in front of their office. Um, I think partnering with a school would be a really good opportunity. Um, or a daycare. Or a daycare. Yeah, that's another good one. Yeah. They would, uh, and then you've got somebody to help you out too. Like I said, that growing season, it gets pretty tough to get there as often as you should. Yeah. And as you guys know, even with fabric, the weeds get away from you. So. <laughs> Or the produce gets away from you, and you have zucchini the size of your thigh. And, well, I don't know what you do with that, but we, we take ours and donate it. But I'm just hoping they make zucchini bread out of it. That's a good idea. Cool. 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 Yeah, and we've actually um, talked about um, doing maybe a high tunnel with the school as well, you know. Um, so get a couple extra months of growing season and hopefully they can use that produce in their lunch program. So I know there's areas out there that do that. Anything else? Since you are so busy during the growing season, have you attempted or tried perennial plants for the garden to ease some of that work yet do in spring? We, we actually did. Um, there was a section, um, I didn't have any, I don't think I had any pictures of it, but there's a section that we um, basically have just tried a few different mulches there, and then we've just spread out different pollinators. Well, actually, last year was the first year that we had a really good take on that. I think the year before we used some old seed and it wasn't very viable, but so if we've, we've actually had one that is going to be a uh, community garden for a long time, actually donated some uh, conservation grade fruiting shrubs, planting cherries, golden currants, things like that, mm -hmm. roni berries. So they've incorporated that kind of into their, um, now it's, um, what do you call it, permaculture, kind of their permaculture orchard now. So. Hmm. And like black chokeberry, currants, they fruit like I mean, a couple years, they do great, you don't have to do anything with them. So it's a good way to increase it without a lot of increased work. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Anybody else? Yeah, all right, well, thanks everyone. We're even a little ahead of schedule, I think. So. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah.